thinking about Isaiah and David, uh, some of you, why not? I've been talking about hymns this morning. Some of you will remember that hymnal that you grew up, you know, looking to, to sing. And for many of you, hymn number one in the hymnal you grew up singing out of was a song called what? Holy, holy, holy. I don't know why I remember that, but in the old hymnal, that's what was page number one. And in that hymn, we see how that writer of that hymn, hello, he was inspired by Scripture. And of course, the hymn reminds us about the Trinity, God in three persons. But that hymn, I hadn't thought a lot about this. Um, We're also reminded in that hymn Uh, we're actually given a warning, and it's the same kind of warning that David speaks of in the 103rd Psalm when David says, do not forget. And and holy, 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 when you get to verse 3, there's this warning about how, how sin in our lives can actually cause us to miss out on seeing God's glory. It, it just does. I'm Just look at this with me. Don't worry, I'm not going to attempt to sing it. Holy, holy, holy. We're only going to look at the third verse. Look at, look at the third verse of this hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Though the darkness hide thee. Think about the darkness in our world. But scripture reminds us, holy, holy, holy. Even though the darkness might hide thee. Look at this. Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Hello? Hello? And the reminder, it's only you, God, only thou art holy. There is none beside me, perfect in power, in love and unity. Purity, sorry. Sometimes my dad didn't let us sing the third stanza, the third verse. And the 103rd Psalm, David says, do not forget. Do not forget all of the Lord's benefits. Do not forget all of the Lord's glory. Then here's where it gets really good. And this is a big piece of why I wanted to select this text for today. Then David begins to write about the character of God and the faithfulness of God. And this is what we must remember. Look with me. Look at verse 3. He forgives all of your iniquity. That's sin. He forgives all of your sin, and he heals your diseases. Uh, So think about it with me. Scripture says our God forgives how much of your sin? Thank you. All. Not some of it, not half of it. The Bible says he forgives all sin. Now, we know from the New Testament that the wages of our sin is death, but the Bible says the gift of God is is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this is interesting. The scripture says God also heals diseases. Y'all know that song we sing, Our God is Healer, right? Okay, here it is. He is the great physician. And so when we see God's promise of healing, here's what most of us do. When we see that in the Bible, okay, there it is. I see God, you're the healer. What you and I do, we decide that we think we know exactly what that healing should look like. Like we're in control. God, help us out, but here's the plan. Lord, here's how I want you to make this all work out. We usually almost always pray for immediate earthly healing. That's just what we do. And I would say this, very often when we pray those prayers, I would say even more so than I I think we realize, God brings that healing. At times we don't even see it. But I want to remind you when we read this text that, hear me out, even in earthly death, God is still the healer. God brings healing and wholeness to some of his sons and daughters that are eternal healings. Now, this may be uncomfortable. When when my mom was under hospice care, a part of me wanted God to rescue her, to give her a healing here on this side of heaven on earth. 
yet God promises that there is a kind of healing where all of the tears and all of the pain and all of the doctor visits and all of the medicines, they are all wiped away because the Lord provides heavenly healing to his children that in the end is way better than anything we could ask or imagine. I'm not telling you not to pray for healing, but realize there are different ways that God brings healing. He brings earthly healing and he brings eternal healing as well. So what do you learn? Here again, we're going to go back to the character of God. What do you learn about the character of God in in verse 3? Our God is a forgiving God. Our God is a healing God. And then look at verse 4. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and with compassion. Uh, You might remember, and I know we've read a lot of Bible since then, but when we were back in the book of Exodus, chapter 13, God said to Moses, he said, Consecrate every firstborn male to me. And God said in that moment, he said, I want you to remember that I am bringing you out of the place of slavery, which is very much like a pit. And God says, I'm bringing you out of Egypt by the strength of my hand. This is what he said in the book of Exodus. And the Lord then said, I will redeem all of my firstborn sons. Now, think about this with me. Here we are now in the book of Psalms. And and God is reminding us again through David's writing I'm bringing you out of the place of the dead because you are my covenant people. I I will redeem you. I will bless you. And then the promise is, after you are redeemed, God says, I'm going to crown you, and then I'm going to proclaim my love and my compassion upon you. What do you see about the character of God right here in this verse? You see that God is redeemer. Now, something interesting happens in Psalm 103. All of a sudden, in verse 6, he shifts... In, from his personal experiences with God, and now he's going to write about how God shows his favor to other people. Look at verse 6. And so the Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all of the oppressed. Man, what a timely verse for our world today. Here's why I say that. There are absolutely times when for some of us, our, our hearts and our minds Uh, Our desire is to align ourselves with with organizations or with causes that will take a stand to demand justice for the oppressed. Happens all the time. And that can be a noble thing. But I think the warning is this. Our mindset might be, if I don't take a stand, the situation is never going to change. You think about this. And when we say that or if we say that, it is almost like, People are are wanting to step into the role of God. I want to play God. I'm going to be the Savior. I'm going to be the one to save the day. And look at this. Verse 6 reminds us, our God, our God. He is the one who will lead and execute all acts of righteousness and justice. Can Can God use us for his glory? Absolutely, yes. But God's plan is that he will lead the way on his terms and in his timelines. So what is the character of God here? Our God is righteous. Our God is just. And then look at verses 8, 9, and 10. Perhaps the most meaningful verse, I think, that speaks to all of us in this one chapter. And so the Lord is compassionate and gracious He's slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. Like, if you can't read that verse and say amen, I don't even know. Like, that is a promise of God. Yet I wonder, friends, how many of us really comprehend this promise? Because so often, for me, maybe for you too, we operate personally in a manner very different than what we see God modeling and and seeing his character. For example, this is where it's about to get real. So often for you and I, 
when we are at odds with someone else, I don't care who it is. It could be someone in your family. It could be a friend. It could be a spouse. It could be a coworker. But when you're at odds with that person, what commonly happens when you've been wronged by that person, you know what we do? We don't get out a, a pencil and paper, but in our minds, we begin to make a list. We begin to take an inventory of everything that person did or said that hurt us. And what I've discovered personally is this. Unfortunately, it's pretty doggone easy to make that list. Like, man, I can make that list real fast. <laughs> he did this. He did that. Then he said this. And then he gave me that look. Or, or he lied. Or he let me down. Or he didn't follow through. And y'all, the list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? Am I right? And I don't know about you, I am incredibly thankful to our Lord to be reminded of His character in these three verses because so often it's beyond my grasp. Look, we just have to read this again. I want to put it back on the screen. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. And man, I just say thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, God. What is the character of God? Our God is compassionate and He is gracious. Now, I don't want to just leave you hanging there like, yeah, that's real. Life is hard. Oops. <laughs> you know, I did it again. Whatever. Something that may be helpful in case you might be the one who has been wronged and you continue to find yourself making this list over and over again and then over time you continue to find more faults in that person and you keep adding to the list which makes the list even longer. Would you today, would you consider making a new list Asking God to show to you the positive characteristics in that person's life. I, I would say this. Um, maybe your perspective changes and you just say to the Lord, Okay, God, we talked about this today at church and, you know, Pastor can't challenge us to do something that's been a struggle for me. Perhaps you would pray, Lord, would you begin to show me how you see that person? I will say this, this is incredibly helpful, especially in marriages. If you're having a hard time relationally in the marriage, how about making a new list? Then after you make a new list, would you be willing to take time to, to say a prayer, thanking God for each of those qualities in that person's life? You're like, what? Yeah, this is a lot, I know, because you're going from over here like, I can't stand that person. They're driving me crazy, and now you're saying, oh, hold on, what? You're asking me to, to look at their quality, the characteristics that are, that are good? And, and not only that, you're asking me to make a list of those things, and then you want me to thank the Lord for that? Oh, wow, yeah, it's a, it's a major shift. The truth is, I'm asking you to do this today before the sun goes down. Because if you don't do it today, it probably is never going to happen. Then in verse 13, uh, you know, David gives us all these examples, all these parallels. And what I love about verse 13, he begins to draw some parallels with dads and their children and even with like grandchildren so that we, you and I, can see even more of the character of God. Now, of course, this got my attention. If you know anything at all about my life journey and, and my wife down here on the front row, uh, we are parents to four. Uh, Jared, Macy, Molly, and Sarah, they're all now young adults. And, and I'm now the grandfather to four. Shiloh, Judah, Noah, and Hayden. 
And so I told you earlier, my wife and I, glory to God, we are now empty nesters. Amen. I kind of like it. I don't, she didn't give me an amen. Yeah, I know. I know. It is hard. But here's what I want to say. As, as I look back at this stage of my life, I, I must confess to God, and I confess to you, the church. There absolutely were many times when I missed the mark in my parenting. No doubt about it. At times, my priorities were wrong. I said things I should not have said to not only my children, but to my wife as well. And and. Some of my actions were quite hypocritical. Absolutely. And so I'm thinking about this. I'm reading Psalm 103. And then I saw a quote this week from D.L. Moody. Uh, By the way, you're like, who is this guy? Yeah, we got some fans over here who went to Moody Bible College. Some of you are flipping through the channels and you've discovered Moody Radio. Awesome. Such great content. Yeah, it's the same guy, that Moody. I'd never heard this quote from him. Look at this. D.L. Moody said, A man ought to live his life so that everybody knows he is a Christian, and most of all, his family ought to know. Can I get a witness on that? So to the men in the room, I'm talking to the men in the room, hear me out. Your faith and your actions matter the most in your home. The most. I I want to encourage you. I want to help you. I'm speaking to especially now younger dads in the room. Redeem the time God gives you with your wife and with your children. Right now. Do not be the man who one day looks back with this long list of regrets. Do not be that guy. Look at verse 13. Here's the text. This is where it comes from. So as a father has compassion on his children, oh, this is how the Lord operates. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now you think about it with me for a moment. You you think about like whoever you could dream up to be the most loving earthly father. And I'm talking about a dad who who understands what it means to parent his children through the lens of the gospel. This guy's not winging it. He understands the truth of God's word when it comes to being a dad and a parent and a husband. You think about that guy. And when that man of God is dealing with his tired, worn-out child, he does not demand of them more than they can perform... But with care, he takes into account their weaknesses. Think about this with me, guys. And that loving father will comfort his child. And he will measure his expectations according to the wisdom and compassion that God has given him. And so you see, when we read this psalm, this is the kind of compassion that David speaks of. In Psalm 103, I've referenced D.L. Moody. Why not Charles Spurgeon? Let's just go for broke here, okay? The great preacher Spurgeon, uh, he talked about the many ways that God shows compassion. Or or some of the older Bible translations, I think King James Version uh, translates this to say the way God shows pity on his children. And so Spurgeon said this, God pities our childish ignorance. He made a list. (laughs) Here we go. He pities our childish weakness. God pities our childish foolishness. He pities our childish naughtiness. God pities our childish stumbles and falls. He pities the pain of his children. He pities a child who has been wronged by another. 
And our God even pities the fears of his own children. And so here we are for you and I. We're often the toddlers, aren't we? Yet the character of God, the promise is this, our God is a genuine and caring father. Then when we read verses 14 through 19, David, he starts to compare and contrast uh, the differences in our temporary earthly lives with God's eternal promises and God's kingdom authority. Let's read this together starting in verse 14. David writes, For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. As for man, his ways are like grass. He blooms like a flower of the field, yet when the wind passes over it, it it vanishes, and its place is no longer even known. But from eternity to eternity, the Lord's faithful love is toward those who fear him and his righteousness, here it is, even toward the grandchildren of those who keep his covenant, who remember to observe his precepts. For the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Now, I I mentioned to you um, that while we're uh, singing some of these songs that we've joked about being throwbacks, the truth is that every song we've sang today uh, has been inspired for the most part by a song. And uh, we're going to conclude here in just a moment by worshiping in the exact same way that David worshiped in this psalm. Uh, You remember how he opened the 103rd Psalm, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name, bless the Lord, O my soul, three times. But I want you to look with me how David closes out the psalm. Look at verse 20. So bless the Lord, all his angels of great strength who do his word, who are obedient to his command. Bless the Lord for those. Bless the Lord, all his armies, his servants who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all the places where he rules. My soul, bless the Lord. And there it is. Just as David started the 103rd Psalm, blessing the Lord three times in a row, he ends the Psalm saying, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord bless the Lord. You know, I don't know what your normal week looks like. Um, Shauna kind of makes fun of me because I'm in a stage of life now when I'm out and about and driving around, you know, I I do turn on moody radio and I'm just listening to sermon after sermon after sermon. But my wife still dials it in in the car to a lot of worship and praise. And that's good. Uh, So you may be in this room this morning, you're saying, oh, What if I'm the guy that doesn't listen to sermons or worship music? You know, maybe you're into politics, talk radio, sports radio. Maybe you're into the greatest, latest, famous artist, whoever they are. Uh, You know, reality check. Years ago at this youth conference I used to coordinate, the Youth Evangelism Conference, I think it was a preacher named David Nasser. Man, he was on fire that night. Of course, his audience was teenagers. And he challenged this arena full of teenagers to consider um, their lives. And he was talking about scripture. He was talking about the Psalms. And and he asked them, I wonder how many of you have memorized more lyrics to the latest pop artist than you have God's word? Mm, Yeah, that's real, isn't it? And maybe for many of us adults in this room, we like our stuff. But maybe we have memorized more things of this world than focusing on our Heavenly Father. I don't know. I don't know. We're all in different places. Um, and so I, I don't, if that's where you're at, I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying, man, look and see the Lord is good. He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. And, 
And as we read the Psalms, no doubt, over and over again, we are given this opportunity to worship here. So, so I'm looking at this, I'm reading this, and then I send a text message to Bernard and Jay. I'm like, all right, I've landed on the 103rd Psalm. And uh, immediately I'm reminded of a song that Matt Redman wrote called 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So today, that's how we're going to close out our service. We're going to sing that song together. And you might be like, I'm not a singer. Well, okay. Congratulations. I'm asking you, even if you can't sing, to open your mouth and with your tone-deaf voice, proclaim the words to this song. Speak it if you can't sing it. It's okay if you're not a great vocalist. It's okay. But don't just sit there as a part of the chosen frozen. I just got someone's attention. Receive the truth of God's holy word. Allow it to transform your life. Be a part of who he is. Sing praises to him. Worship him. Yes, there are distractions. There were yesterday, there are today, and there will be tomorrow. But good grief. We got about seven minutes left in this worship service that we don't have to worry about all the distractions and we can focus on lifting high the name of Jesus, okay? So that's what I want to do. I'm going to pray, and after I pray, we're going to stand together and we are going to worship the Lord. Even if you can't sing, speak it. God, thank you for today. I, Lord, sometimes it's hard when we spend the week in the Word and we see so many of your promises, but I just couldn't get over how much of your character I saw in this 103rd Psalm. So much of who you are, your promises. And so, Lord, man, if we're kind of going through life one foot in, one foot out, we're, we're going to struggle. In fact, we're going to do more than struggle. We're going to crash and burn. And so, God, my prayer for each of us, my prayer for my own life is that I would step into all of your promises. That I wouldn't just on a Sunday morning say, all right, it's time right now to sing, bless the Lord, O my soul. But let this be my life song. God, let us prioritize, let us understand the importance of what it really means to be a follower, a true disciple. Not being discipled by all the things of this world, but God being discipled by your truth, your precepts, your promises, and your holy word. Change us for your kingdom's glory. God, for the dads in the room who, who like me, look back and we see where we've missed the mark and fallen short, God, change our lives. And let that be from the overflow of the time we spend with you not acting like we've got it all figured out. God, change us for your kingdom's glory. Let us be the men who love our wives well, who raise up our children to know you and love you, who, who don't kind of act one way at one place and a different way in the household. God, let our lives bring you glory. God, for the moms in this room, for the grandparents in this room, for the kids in this room, for all of us, God, we're going to cry out to you this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. God, this time is, is an offering to you. We ask that you would receive it now for your kingdom's glory.